When we left off, we were discussing um, pseudo events and imagined community and how we come together and think about ourselves as this thing because of popular culture. And one of my favorite things to talk about and write about is the voice. Um, I actually published an article all about The Voice and um, how it sells people's dreams. And uh, what strikes me in this part of The Voice here is the way people end up feeling connected to people who they've never met. And some of that is place-based. So if you look at these quotes from Twitter, this was 2018 uh, on the hashtag Team Alicia, the voice. Um, so they're, they're going through and it's like, amazing, simply amazing. I had no doubt you could do it, my friend. The future is bright. Hashtag Team Britain. Hashtag Team Alicia. When you don't really want a specific person to win, so you just root for them all. And then all the hashtags. And then you got this one. You're not alone. I even did an audio extract of the performance, and it's currently my ringtone. I prayed earnestly that she made the playoffs, but hashtag Team Alicia was a bloodbath. Lots of amazing talents went home. I wish they didn't have to have Alicia freaking Keys' team. And then this is the important one here from New Black. Um, we are cheering for you here in Sanford, North Carolina, young man. Hashtag Team Britain. Hag, hashtag Team Alicia. Britain, keep showing America we have great talent in our small city. Good luck tonight. And you have won already in my sight. You have accomplished so much just making it this far. That is a functionalist approach to popular culture in that these people feel connected in some way. It serves a function for these folks. And not only does it serve a function, but you get the imagined community of Sanford, North Carolina, where people get to say, yay! Somebody from my hometown is on The Voice. I'm looking and I'm seeing these people who look famous now. I know someone famous, so I hope you win. Britain, I, I didn't watch that season. That might be the worst singer ever, but they don't care. They're in it for this imagined connection, right? Picture any, you know, we just had the Olympics go on. Every time, and it's always NPC, NBC does the, that does the reporting on the Olympics and the hometown heroes about it. Why NBC? Why does NBC do, do so much Olympic coverage on their local news? Why NBC and not ABC or CBS? What was that? National. Well, they're all national. The local news for NBC. What channel is the Olympics on? NBC. NBC, right? So it's its own internal advertising. And we'll take that to the voice here in a second. But what happens is um, NBC tells you about all so NBC DFW they tell you about all the local DFW uh, people that are in the Olympics and that feels great for the people right they have families in the area they're like oh there's my baby that's great but what they're also trying to get you to do is feel a connection and when you feel that connection it becomes more important so that's where the functionalist approach comes in. It's just like watching 
the Cowboys and thinking, yeah, I like the hometown team because I live there, right? With the Olympics, well, we're made to feel if you're American, you support the American athletes, right? But then you get the added benefit of, oh, I want to root for the person from Arlington, right? Or we had somebody from UTA who won two silver medals, right? And, and the university's like, yeah, we had an Olympian, right? That makes you feel connected. And with NBC, and I, the voice just happens to be on NBC, one of the things they love to do on the local news is they love to report on the people who are local to the voice. So when they have somebody in the top 10, they like go talk to their family or talk to their teachers in the area and do a report on that. It's not CBS doing it because it's not news in that kind of way, but it helps promote the TV show, right? And it helps people feel connected to something, even if it's something entirely remote from them. Um, and I'll have more to talk about the voice later on in the semester when we talk about labor because um, really the voice is pretty messed up Grazian then goes on to talk about popular culture as a resource for public reflection and what I've included here because Grazian talks about it a bit is a image that we had from earlier in the semester when we talked about Roland Barr. Um, because it brings back myth. So think back to our discussion about Roland Barth. Um, Barth sees myth as a second order signification, right? And you can remember we talked about the Saturday Night Live Totino spoof, right? Where um, they're they're ripping apart um, commercials in the inherent misogyny that you find in commercials. Um, Grazian says that myth helps people to make sense of abstract ideas through fictional characters. There are stories we tell uh, us ourselves about how the world works. They demonstrate to us what it means to be human. And so what he says on page 34 is their quote, stories we tell ourselves about ourselves. And, you know, myths are really old. You can go back to the Odyssey. The whole point in the Odyssey of, that these myths help delineate is anything that was dangerous where people would go out in the Mediterranean Sea. So the, those of you that don't know the Odyssey, or have never read it, it's Odysseus, it's ancient Greek, and Odysseus goes out in the Mediterranean, he's doing all these different, this journey, and he's doing things that would basically get you killed at that time. They did not have the greatest ships in ancient Greece. If you go out in the Mediterranean, that's dangerous. If you go through the Strait of Gibraltar, into the Atlantic, even more dangerous. So in order to warn people against these things, they come up with different myths um, to keep people from doing it. That there's going to be some sea monsters, that there's going to be Medusa out there to turn you into stone, right? It's not that they made up these characters for no reason. And it's not that they truly believed that these things existed out there. It was ways of understanding what not to do and what to do. Religious texts do the same thing. Remember, we were talking about functionalism. Um, and you get a similar thing happen with Aesop's stories. The tortoise and the hare, all those. Grimm's fairy tales. Everything is about constructing myths so that we can make more sense out of the world. And popular culture is our contemporary 
myth. Or myth creator. The next thing he gets into here is uh, celebrity and entertainment. And essentially, celebrity and entertainment, they serve this role for contemporary society. Instead of talking about Aesop's fables or Ada, uh, Odysseus, myth acts through celebrities. They help bring us ethical dilemmas. He says, quote, they give tangible form to otherwise abstract ethical dilemmas concerning the nature of human relations and social behaviors. And for him, the similarity here is to Aesop's fables. You also get, you can use celebrity and entertainment as conversation starters. So this is where you get quote unquote water cooler talk. Um, and I mentioned this last cast, class, we can't talk about tawdry tales about people we know, affairs, one night stands, that's not appropriate. But we can talk about celebrities who experience a particular thing. We can talk about fictional TV characters without offending. And so uh, that ties into the next one, which is reflection and debate without harm. So we can discuss the lives of these distant others to talk through these problems. So he asks the question, what is the social function of celebrity gossip? And his answer on page 36 is, quote, the celebrity status of those involved provided an excuse for the rest of us to discuss sensitive topics of conversation and pass moral judgment with ease. So one example I can give you of this and this uh, was actually kind of fresh. I was watching stuff on the run-up to uh, the vice presidential debate, and they were talking about the popularity of different vice presidential candidates. And the least popular presidential candidate in the last 10 elections was a man, former vice president Dan Quayle. Most of you have probably never heard of Dan Quayle. Uh, well, let me rephrase that. Has anybody in here heard of Dan Quayle? Singularly disliked. He was so net negative on this poll. He was George H.W. Bush's vice president. And that poll was when George H.W. Bush was running for re-election. Now, usually you would think running for a re-election of vice president you're not going to be that negative in your perception. But this is a great example. There's the television show Murphy Brown, which had a reboot a few years ago. It just really didn't do well. I was excited when I was a kid. You got to I I lived in the country. I didn't get cable for many years of my life. I watched Rabbit Ear television and When I look at my son and see the kind of popular culture entertainment he gets to experience versus what I got to experience, it's rather sad for me. Um, because I had to do stuff like watch Murphy Brown when I was going to sleep. Because you had three networks. If you wanted to watch TV, you had to watch one of them. So I would watch Murphy Brown as I laid in bed to go to sleep. Well, Murphy Brown, she's a single woman. She's a reporter in Washington, D.C. That's what the whole show is around, okay? She decides as a single woman that she wanted to have a child. And I forget whether she adopted. I think she adopted. Or whether she had in vitro fertilization. I can't remember which one. But Dan Quayle freaked out and talked about how immoral Murphy Brown was, that how awful single motherhood was, and he just went off about single motherhood. And now think about that. Think about how many people in America have single moms, or are single moms, or 
know and care about single moms. It's equivalent to J.D. Vance talking about childless cat ladies, right? It's appalling. So he went off on Murphy Brown, and that was, for him, the conversation started. For him, it was not insulting some individual single mom out there, but talking about how immoral it is to raise a child, to in, especially to intentionally raise a child without a father figure. And so while he was on his moral high horse against uh, Murphy Brown, it also led to him being the least popular vice presidential candidate of the past 10 elections. And that was a sitting vice president. So I find it a, a good entertaining story in American politics. We also get the issue of hashtag me too. Now, what was interesting, you're reading the second issue. Um, the second edition of Grazian's Mix It Up. And he had this picture in the book from, why can't I think of the name of the show? And y'all probably don't even know the show. I think it's House of Cards. House of Cards, thank you. Whew. I was sweating there for a second. Kevin Spacey was on House of Cards, and I, I, I'm blanking on why it was in the book, but ironically, he got shown the door on House of Cards because of hashtag Me Too, where it turned out Kevin Spacey was raping at, um, teenage boys. Yes. So Kevin Spacey rightfully got canceled. Um, I don't know what the legal situation. I'm not. I, I didn't keep following what happened with Kevin Spacey. You've got things like the statute of limitations, right? So if th something happened too far ago for when the accusation comes out, then there's nothing that can happen. Um, and I mean, I, it was statutory rape, but statutory rape is still rape. Um, but in any way, oh, because this was about mythical characters and his, the way he was such a big character on House of Cards. Then they end up getting rid of him and his wife become, it takes over as the lead role. And it's just like, never to talk about him again. Um, but these things kind of come together. We'll talk more about Me Too. Um, but he also talks about popular culture as um, some way for us to talk about parenting. And he asks the question, why do we care about child celebrity? or, I mean, celebrities' children. And the answer from a functionalist perspective is that there's the universality of pregnancy, childbirth, and parenthood. Not everyone's going to have children. Not everyone can have children, right? But it's something that is experienced by the vast majority of people on earth. So it's something that we can connect to. And if we didn't have child, if we don't have children, we also have parents. If they're absent, if we never got to meet them, those are also experiences that help us think about celebrities and what they do. Um, and parenthood is fraught with anxiety. So when we talk about stories about celebrity parents, 
it helps us deal with being a becoming a parent.